Hello, good afternoon, go after midday, and welcome to our next talk in the theatre. We're going to be welcoming Corne Hoskam, and he's going to be giving us a talk called Introduction to Blazer and Umbraco 9. So a huge round of applause for our first time speaker. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all very much for being here with me today. Um, let's see. Is the screen working properly? Thank you. Thank you, This isn't mine that we're seeing. There we go. Perfect. All right. As I was saying, thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, my name is Cornet, and I'd like to welcome you all very much to my introduction to Blazer and Umbraco 9. So, before we get to the informative part of today's session, let me start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Corné, Corné Oskam. I'm a software engineer over in the Netherlands, uh, currently employed at a company called I.O. Um, looking back, I've been, uh, my first interaction with Umbraco has been around six years ago, uh, where the last three years or so have consisted of pretty much full-time Umbraco usage, um, ranging from Umbraco 6, 7, 8, 9, and uh, as of uh, tomorrow, hopefully 10. Um, besides that, Umbraco is certified master, um, and as of last year, I also have my own tech blog, uh, which mostly consists of Umbraco related content. I'm very happy to add, as of this morning, also Umbraco MVP. <laughs> Woo. Thank you, thank you. Well, that didn't go right. But enough about me, uh, let's talk about Blazor and Umbraco 9. So, during this talk, we're going to be discussing three different subject matters um, that will hopefully answer some of your questions about Blazor, if you already have some of them. So first off, we'll be taking a look at Blazor itself uh, by answering the question, what is this Blazor people keep talking about? Next up, we'll take a look at the meat and potatoes of today's talk uh, by explaining what's possible and or needed to integrate Blazor into an existing or new Blazor replication, uh, Umbraco replication, sorry. Um, and finally, we'll be taking a look at the pros and cons of um, using Blazor with Umbraco 9 uh, so that we can determine whether or not you should be using Blazor in your applications. So, what exactly is Blazor? Blazor is an open source framework developed by Microsoft, um, which is used to create interactive client-side uh, web UIs with .NET. So, in other words, um, Blazor is a .NET framework that allows us to render a UI using HTML and CSS for a wide range of browsers. Um, where in a more commonly known scenario, uh, one which uses JavaScript for any and all browser interaction, with Blazor we can use C Sharp instead of JavaScript. Not just that, but because it's all based on C-sharp, and in particular based on .NET, um, it allows us to share the same server-side and client-side logic written in the same languages and frameworks. So now that we have a very basic understanding of what Blazor is, how can we run this Blazor, C-sharp, or .NET code in our browser? And the answer to that would be WebAssembly. So what exactly is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is a low-level assembly-like language that allows us um, Sorry, um, and a pretty much well-defined uh, web standard by these days. Um, like I said, supported by pretty much all major browsers um, and operating systems, including but not limited to uh, Firefox, Chrome, uh, Edge, and Safari. Um, it allows us to run compiled code to pretty much near native speeds compared to non-browser applications, and also runs very nicely alongside and even complements JavaScript, where WebAssembly is known for its um, performance and power, and JavaScript for its flexibility. So, the things we just mentioned about Blazor um, and WebAssembly, so far they specifically cover about half of what Blazor is, and it's specifically the Blazor WebAssembly version. But there are two versions of Blazor that are worth mentioning, uh, two different hosting models to be precise, um, and that would be Blazor WebAssembly and Blazor server-side. So let's take a look at the two different versions of Blazor and the differences between them, starting with Blazor server-side. So, server-side Blazor is the version of Blazor that as the name would suggest, uh, both stays and runs completely on the server. In this case, the server is responsible for pretty much all uh, interaction and logic that happens on our application. And whenever an update or interaction that takes place, um, the server calculates the difference in our DOM, uh, aka the difference in our HTML, um, and sends that over to our clients using a SignalR WebSocket connection. 
Once that's done, our browser updates our UI, uh, which also means that uh, because of that, no .NET code ever leaves our server, um, which also means that this particular version of Blazor does not, in fact, require WebAssembly to run any code, only a very minimalistic use of JavaScript. So when we load our server-side application in our browser, we can see that there are a relatively small amount of files that are being transferred. Um, in total, let's say a couple hundreds of kilobytes. Um, the most important ones to note, in this case, would be the blazor.server.js file, um, which allows our app to establish a SignalR connection to our um, uh, server uh, to handle all our UI updates and event forwarding. When installing and launching a Blazor server-side application for the first time, we'll be greeted by this very friendly Hello World application, showcasing some very basic functionalities uh, within Blazor, things like uh, a counter, uh, but also uh, the ability to fetch data using things like an HTTP client. Um, at this point, it's also good to mention that there is one major downside of Blazor server-side. And that's the fact that uh, because all updates take place on the server, uh, we need to maintain an active server connection. If that somehow happens to fail, we get greeted by this quite unfriendly attempting to reconnect to our server prompt and our application will simply freeze up. The second version of Blazor, and perhaps the most notable one of the two, would be Blazor WebAssembly. So with Blazor WebAssembly, um, our entire application is executed directly in our browser using WebAssembly, um, instead of requiring an active server connection. Any updates or interactions that take place within our browser get processed and updated locally uh, using what we learned previously using WebAssembly. Um, when we load our WebAssembly application into our browser, we can see that there are quite a large amount of files that are being transferred compared to the server-side variant. Instead of the uh, blazor.server.js file, um, our WebAssembly application relies on a blazor.webassembly.js file, uh, which in turn downloads the .NET runtime and all the compiled DLLs of our application uh, so that it can run in our browser. When installing and launching our Blazor WebAssembly application for the first time, we will notice that we get greeted by quite a similar looking Hello World application, and you would indeed be correct. Uh, both versions of Blazor are component-based, and order uh, that there are a couple of nuances between the two versions that make it unique, um, we were able to reuse the same uh, version of our components in both versions of Blazor. Uh, the major difference, of course, remains whether or not the execution is done locally uh, on our, our server. Now that we have a very basic understanding of what people keep talking about with the word blazer, uh, let's bring the world of Umbraco into the picture, shall we? Um, because there are two different hosting models of Blazor, uh, we will also be taking a look at how to integrate them with Umbraco separately. We'll start off, like before, to take a look at Blazor server side. So uh, the benefit of Blazor server side in particular is that we can add it to an existing Umbraco 9 application uh, relatively easily. Not just that, but because uh, instead of having our entire front-end application having to rely on a framework like Blazor, uh, we can choose to only use one or more particular Blazor components uh, into our existing applications instead of requiring our entire front-end to be a Blazor application. So, Let's take a quick peek at the uh, technical requirements uh, for a Blazor side application. Um, there are four, uh, four steps that we have to take to um, uh, make this happen. Uh, first off, we have to configure a couple of services in uh, our application, uh, specifically a services and some endpoints. Um, after that, we have to make sure that we inject our Razor directives into our application using the imports.razor file, uh, which pretty much allows our Razor, uh, Blazor application to know which namespaces it uh, should access. Um, after that, we need to make sure that we add the blazor.server.js script somewhere on a page that requires a connection to our Blazor application. And finally, we're able to render our Blazor component um, either using an await render component async or, as of recently, also a uh, helper for that, uh, allowing us to specify the type of our uh, components that we wish to render. So we'll take a look at a um, quick example of a component that ships with the fresh install of Blazor, in this case being the counter. Um, for those who haven't used Blazor before, what we can see right here would be a very simple example of a paragraph uh, showcasing a current count uh, variable. Um, underneath that, we got a button with an unclick handler calling the increment count method. 
Um, and as you would suggest from the naming, uh, whenever we press that button, uh, the number would increment, and we automatically update the number shown on the paragraph. Now, let's say we want to render this specific component on one of our uh, CS HTML templates, for example, let's say our homepage. Uh, what you can see is uh, quite a simple example of our HTML markup uh, with a head and a body tag. Um, and within our body tag, we can call the render component a sig method. Um, within that, we, speci uh, we specify the component that we wish to render and the fact that we want to render the component server-side. Um, the reason why we have to set it to server pre-rendered in this case would be that because our client in this case uh, does not uh, contain WebAssembly, uh, we have to make sure that our server renders it instead of our client, otherwise it simply won't function. Um, lastly, like we said, we need to make sure that our uh, page has access to the blazor.server.js um, by adding the script tag as shown right there. Um, and then we're pretty much good to go. Another cool example and a benefit of using Blazor server side is the fact that we don't only rely on interactions and events uh, that happen in our browser itself, um, but because the client and server are connected to each other, we can also trigger an update to all our connected clients uh, from within our server, if we wish to do so. So, in this example, uh, I was curious if I could find a way to hook into the published event or uh, published notification within Brock Online um, to see whenever we publish something if I can actually update the uh, connected clients um, and display something whenever that happens. And that was very much possible. So, um, what I've done, a little bit of technical uh, details, is would be to create a singleton service, in this case, uh, in which I register my client. Um, and into that, um, on the, the property has changed uh, value, I register that I need to update my client whenever that happens. And on the server side, I actually call that uh, event whenever we update, uh, whenever the update notification gets called. So this results in a client that automatically updates itself whenever we publish an item in the back office. Um, and in this case, it's only a very simple uh, displaying a list of a when, uh, what doc type am I publishing and what is the date of publishing. Um, but as you can imagine, if you were to build your entire site uh, component-based, uh, there are a lot of uh, use cases for this, uh, let's say, automatically updating um, all our clients' uh, specific components if we should do so, um, you name it. So, that's one of the many options why we should, could use Blazor server-side with Umbraco 9. So, next up, let's take a look at Blazor WebAssembly with Umbraco 9. Blazor WebAssembly follows a little bit of a different project structure than Blazor server-side, as with WebAssembly, we aren't required to keep an active server connection up. Because of the recent developments around Blazor, we also have at least two different options uh, of project architecture to choose from. The first option would be to use a more standalone or either a headless uh, version uh, of a Blazor WebAssembly application, um, where you would have, let's say, a dedicated application running with, um, uh, to, to serve your Blazor WebAssembly application to your client um, and use API endpoints to fetch all the data um, to display on your page. Um, the second option that we have, and that we'll be taking a look at afterwards, uh, will be to integrate uh, Blazor WebAssembly using web components into our um, application. Um, yeah, we'll take a look at that shortly. So, first off, the standalone and headless version. Um, for such a setup, I created a very basic example project um, where we're able to both use the WebAssembly client and an Umbraco server in the same solution, if we wish to do so, um, as long as we don't ex uh, directly reference the, the two projects in between them. The benefit of using such a uh, project setup is that we're able to share uh, client-side logic and models uh, between the two applications, if we wish to do so, like I said, though, as long as we don't directly reference any Umbraco um, related DLLs between the two different projects. A quick sketch on how such a, uh, on how such a structure so, uh, could look could be as follows. Um, with an example of our client project um, being indirectly coupled using API calls, again, very basic example, um, making API calls to our Umbraco 9 back office to fetch all our data, um, and again, like I said, being able to share our models and logic in between the two applications um, so that we don't have to do our work twice. Um, yeah, and that's also a very major use case. So, 
I've been experimenting myself with such a setup, which led me to create a bit of an example starter kit project um, to see what's uh, possible with such a structure um, and try out a couple of interesting concepts, uh, which would be, let's say, uh, sharing uh, custom view models and model builders, model, model builders models between the two versions. Difficult words. <laughs> um, dynamically serializing and deserializing uh, the models from Umbraco, uh, trying out things like dependency injection, um, working with the block list editor dynamically on a Blaze replication, but also server side rendering of uh, components. So, the result of that, as it stands right now, is a very basic Blazor WebAssembly application, which is pre rendered by our server uh, that uses Blazor components for each of our different block list editor blocks that we have available in the back office. Um, this can be compared to, let's say, a React or an Angular application where the CMS is only really used for storing data and the actual page composition, um, but the client itself is responsible for the actual markup. This also means that because of uh, the power of Blazor, um, and in this case in particular .NET and C Sharp, um, we can do pretty much all browser interactions that we wish without having to do any JavaScript work. Let's say, very basic example, um, I'm clicking on a frequently asked questions component and I add or remove a specific class to hide a uh, property. Um, basic interactions, but no JavaScript needed whatsoever. The second option, and the one that I'm most excited about at this point in time, uh, which is, has been made available recently, um, is integrating Blazor WebAssembly components by using them as web components or HTML elements. Um, with the use of the custom element NuGet package, which is provided by Microsoft, currently in its early alphas, um, we're able to uh, turn our Blazor components into a reusable custom HTML element. Um, in our Blazor WebAssembly application, uh, we start off by registering our component uh, by specifying the register as custom component, uh, giving the uh, template of what type of component we wish to specify, um, and specify a name uh, for the HTML element itself. Then, in our client application, uh, which again can be, let's say, a homepage.cshtml uh, page, um, we have to target the specific JavaScript file from our custom elements package. Um, and combine that with the Blazor WebAssembly.js that we have to load into. And once it's done, we can pretty much call uh, our newly created Blazor Web Component application uh, just like we would any other HTML element in our existing application. So, the first major use case of using Blazor components uh, as custom web components is that we're able to use and reuse them pretty much everywhere uh, within our front end application um, uh, yeah, and even existing applications. Um, and I want to give a huge shout out to uh, Lee Messenger for this, for providing this um, experiment project. He has been doing a lot of work on this, um, and it has inspired me to, to continue uh, working on this even more. Um, but maybe even more exciting than using this on our front end is that we're able to make use of these custom HTML elements in our Umbraco back office. This allows us to create uh, custom dashboards, sections, and even custom property editors that are powered by Blazor. Um, without any or barely any need to write any JavaScript at all. As shown right here, an example property editor, um, fully built in Blazor, that can persistently read and write the stored data in Umbraco, just like any old property editor would, but without the use of AngularJS. So, with the latest developments going on at Microsoft, and with the release of .NET 6 in uh, particular, uh, we have a large amount of great new features available for us that make Blazor WebAssembly a lot more interesting than, let's say, in .NET 5 or before that. The first two points would be the use of an application state, or persistent component state, uh, which allows us to render our page with an initial set of data, um, and only if that's not available, uh, allow, um, make our application re-request that data uh, and also pre-renders that data. Um, this makes it very efficient for our browser, um, so that we don't actually uh, need to reload our page every uh, initial load, uh, but only if the actual data has changed from the pre-rendered version. After the second of that, uh, we also have the option to set more particular metadata for our pages um, from within our subcomponents. So let's say uh, things like metadata, titles, uh, pretty much uh, all types of uh, uh, head tags. Um, we're able to make use of scoped files, so let's say a particular JavaScript or a CSS files that we want to uh, use within a specific component um, and only have them be available over there, possible with .NET 6. Um, the use of wildcard page parameters so that we can have our Blazor components um, be responsible for their own routing uh, and be a catch-all for specific routes. 
We're able to reuse our Blazor components in, let's say, for example, a WPF or even a .NET MAUI application. Um, we're able to render Blazor with JavaScript if we wish to do so, so even rendering Blazor components within React or Angular. Um, able to use Blazor as a web component, uh, which also enables us, let's say, uh, like we uh, showcased, to use it in our Braco back office. And the file sizes have just been made a lot smaller in .NET 6 compared to the previous versions. So now, after everything we just talked about, the question for many probably remains, should I be using Blazor in my applications? And the answer to that would be, it depends. Just like the decisions you would make if you were to choose to go for a single page application uh, framework, let's say React, Angular, Vue.js, uh, Blazor has similar trade-offs to make. Um, so let's take a quick look at the pros and cons for the different versions of Blazor. So starting off by Blazor server side, um, pros, it was great. it's great if you already have a .NET development team, but again, on the other hand, it's less useful if you have a team of JavaScript developers sitting around um, Yeah, that would have a, hard, a more difficult time to transition to Blazor than a .NET development team. Uh, we're able to share our code and libraries between both the client and the server uh, with the use of Blazor. Um, another huge pro uh, compared to the other version of Blazor would be uh, less loading times because Blazor server side uh, keeps all of its logic on the server, so less files that need to be transferred. We're able to push UI updates to our clients and there's no need to run WebAssembly. Um, but on the other side, the con would again be uh, there's no support for offline uh, when using Blazor server side and you need an active server to run ASP.NET Core to uh, have our application function. So, the other side would be Blazor WebAssembly. Again, pretty uh, similar pros and cons to start off with. Great if you have a .NET development team, a bit less uh, useful for a JavaScript development team. And again, being able to share your code on libraries between the two versions, uh, between the client and server. Um, we have near native performance when running our application in our browser uh, because of uh, WebAssembly. Um, we have offline support. Uh, once we have our application downloaded once, uh, we can um, make sure that if our browser cached the proper files, uh, we have our application function even without an active internet connection. And we're able to even reuse uh, our components in the Umbraco back office. Um, but the cons on the other side would sadly be the larger file sizes and download times because uh, the entire runtime and DLLs need to be transferred for, to the client first to be able to uh, work. And a lack of legacy support because WebAssembly is not supported in Internet Explorer for those who somehow would still want to support that. Um, sadly, not an option. So with that, I hope you all learned something interesting today about the world of Blazor and Embraco 9. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me either today or these couple of days over at Code Garden or on social media. You can find me on Twitter at, at Hoskam or check out my blog to stay up to date with my latest articles on Um But for now, I would like to thank you all very much for your attention and hopefully I will see you all in the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corno. Um, if we could all stick around in a few minutes at 20 past, we have a fantastic talk called Containers and Umbraco, using Docker to host a load balanced Umbraco website by the wonderful Carl Sarguna. But another massive round of applause for Corno, first co-garden, and here he is on stage. See you at 20 past.